Hi, I'm Scott Tarr. I'm with North Star Concrete Consulting, and I'm honored to receive the Concrete International Award for my article in the November 2020 issue of Concrete International Magazine. The article is a Q&A and it has a series of four questions pertaining to the design and construction of slabs on ground applying ACI 318. First question was simply, can I use ACI 318 to design slabs on ground? And 318 is clear in section 148, this code does not apply to the design and construction of slabs on ground unless the slab transmits vertical loads or lateral forces from other portions of the structure to the soil. So just because the slab doesn't transmit vertical loads or lateral forces from other portions of the structure doesn't mean the slab is not required to carry vertical loads and forces. The slabs on ground carry tremendous vertical loads and forces and they should be designed for a structural load carrying capacity, but that is not included in ACI 318. Another thing is reinforced concrete is designed to crack. The concrete carries the compressive forces and the steel reinforcing carries the tensile forces after the concrete cracks. And one thing about slabs on ground is that cracks in slabs on ground because of uh, the tremendous uh, amount of traffic especially in industrial uh, slabs on ground. Uh, these can be uh, long-term maintenance issues. So owners uh, don't want to see a lot of random cracking in concrete slabs on ground. So ACI 360 has developed uh, certain criteria um, to accommodate the cracking that occurs in concrete slabs on ground. The first one is the cracking occurs solely beneath saw cut contraction joints. This can be an unreinforced slab or a lightly reinforced slab for enhanced aggregate interlock, which I'll get to in just a second. Second criteria is that cracking that occurs um, is controlled as far as its widening, crack width control. This can be done either with using conventional steel reinforcing bars at about a half a percent, that's the cross-sectional area of the steel versus the cross-sectional area of the slab, half a percent or greater. Uh, it can also be accommodated by uh, the use of fibers. And the third criteria is designing to avoid tensile cracking altogether. And it talks about two different design methodologies uh, that keep the, the concrete into compression, and that's shrinkage compensating concrete and post-tension concrete. Second question in the article was, what is the minimum reinforcement for slabs on ground? And as I just said, slabs on ground can be designed unreinforced. So 0% reinforcing can be included in a slab on ground. ACI 360 talks about joint spacing, depth, and timing. And it includes a, a, a chart to determine what the joint spacing should be based on the concrete shrinkage potential. Now this joint spacing does not necessarily mean the joints are going to function properly. It just means that you're not going to get out of joint random cracking. So one of the big things today is uh, extended joint designs, designs that have joint spacing beyond that recommended by ACI 360. And this is possible, but you need to focus on three things. You need to focus on decreasing the concrete shrinkage potential, decreasing the restraint to that shrinkage potential, and including something uh, feature for crack width control because the risk is that you will get some intermediate out of joint random cracking. So as I said, the uh, joint spacing recommendations in 360 don't necessarily mean that your joints are gonna function um, at that spacing. You need to include details in those joints to um, ensure joint stability and load transfer. And some of those details are including smooth dowels in joints. These can be bars or plates on baskets. And the second one is enhanced aggregate interlock. Now unlock, unlike the crack width control conventional reinforcing of half a percent steel or greater, enhanced aggregate interlock is achieved with a tenth of a percent steel. Now this is a light amount of steel transferred through the saw cut control joints and the intent there is that the joint will activate and widen slightly to accommodate the shrinkage potential of the concrete so it won't result in out of joint cracking but it also won't allow the joints to widen beyond aggregate interlock load transfer so you have enhanced aggregate interlock. ACI 318 unfortunately includes a minimum temperature shrinkage reinforcement percentage of 0.18%. Now this is more than the, point, the tenth of a percent steel for enhanced, enhanced aggregate interlock, but significantly less than the half percent steel needed for crack width control. So if you use 0.18%, the risk is that you'll get out of joint cracking and the width of those cracks are going to require maintenance. 
So um, this is a, a, a percentage of steel that's not recommended for concrete floors on ground that are going to be subjected to uh, repetitive loading. Let's talk about what the cracks, uh, when cracking occurs in a slab on ground, um, how that performs. So in a non-reinforced versus reinforced. Let's say this is our concrete slab on ground. We'll put it on the ground and there's plenty of frictional force between the slab and the base to restrain volumetric changes due to temperature changes and uh, drying, shrinkage. So we're going to simulate that as being pins. We're going to anchor that slab. So in a non-reinforced lab, as that volumetric change occurs, that decrease in temperature or that decrease in, in moisture, you're going to get a crack. And once that crack happens, the tension is alleviated and the crack then widens. So you get a wide crack. Same situation for a reinforced lab, only we've got the reinforcement in this lab. Reinforcement goes to the top, that's the tensile zone for a slab on ground, not the bottom. Now once that initial crack occurs, the steel is engaged. So unlike the unreinforced slab now, that doesn't necessarily alleviate the tensile stresses. Now you've got two pieces of concrete. They've got restraint to that um, continued shrinkage of the concrete. So now you have two pieces that are shrinking. You could get more cracking. Now you have four pieces and you get more cracking. So you can see the concept is the higher the steel percentage in your concrete slab, the more cracks you'll get. The tighter each of those cracks are, but the more cracks you'll get. So we want to stay at a tenth of a percent with the joint spacing recommendations in 360 in order to avoid those visible random cracks. And there's a, an example of those. The third question in the Q&A was, can concrete with a total air content above 3% be hard traveled successfully? Well, the answer there is not recommended. <laughs> it is a risk of surface blisters and surface delaminations using any kind of power equipment. As you're floating the concrete slab, you're manipulating and reorienting the concrete and those tiny entrained air bubbles or the smaller entrapped air bubbles coalesce together into larger air bubbles. And if these air bubbles end up uh, near the surface, you can get blisters. And then as it's troweled either by trowel blades or angled combination blades, um, these larger air voids can be flattened into lenses just below the surface that can lead to surface delamination. So anytime you have an air content, total air content above 3%, the risk of surface blisters and delaminations goes up. There's an example of delaminations on the left and a cross-sectional view of a surface blister on the right. Third question, and probably the reason that I uh, was awarded um, the Concrete International um, Award was um, what can be done to protect slabs on ground that will be subjected to the various exposure conditions as defined in ACI 318? And I've got freezing and thawing here as one because this is an issue that comes up repeatedly. This is exposure category F. So if you have um, uh, a concrete that's subjected to um, freezing and thawing conditions in the presence of uh, water, um, this can be problematic. It should be air entrained. However, I just got done saying that we can't have air entrained concrete given a hard trowel surface. So if it has to have air entrainment, we must only screed, bull float, and broom texture the slab. But most of the time we want our slabs on ground to be trowel finished. So we don't want it to be air entrained. And in this situation, we must keep it dry. We can't let it get into these situations of F1 or F2 where you have exposure to water or exposure to water and de-icers on uh, uh, level F3. So this is easier said than done. Of course, you have a, a slab on ground, perhaps placed in the fall, um, and the building is not dried in until the, the spring. So you have that slab, non-air and train, going through a winter season. And it's easier said than done to keep it dry. But luckily, we have a densified hard trowel finish. So what we're really trying to do is prevent it from reaching that critical saturation level again. Once the concrete hydrates, the saturation level drops below the critical amount, and we're trying to prevent resaturation of that concrete. And that hard trowel densified surface gives us a little bit of time to do that. We need to get those puddles and ponds off the surface of that slab as quickly and diligently as possible. I recommend having scrubbers on site, uh, squeegees, um, and have your uh, crew get rid of those puddles and ponds.
Here's an example of ponded areas uh, that were subjected to freeze-thaw cycles over a winter. And the scaling that occurred occurred only in the ponded areas. It actually didn't occur one inch outside of the perimeter of the ponded area, which tells me that the ponded area resaturated to the above critical saturation level. Just outside of that was exposed to the same freezing and thawing cycles, but because it wasn't critically saturated, it didn't experience any scaling. So we need to make sure we remove that water and prevent that critical resaturation. The other exposure categories are W, S, and C. They also all revolve around the water content, the resaturation or the amount of water that is allowed into that concrete slab. Category W is exposure to water in service. Category S is exposure to water-soluble sulfates in the soil. And category C is corrosion protection of reinforcement. And within each of these categories, there are different classes that go from zero to one, two, or even three. And you start at zero, which is dry, and you increase to class one or two or three, depending on the amount of water that is in contact with that slab. Now we're talking about liquid water in contact with the slab on ground. So what are we talking about here? And how can we achieve that zero class in each of these categories where the slab is, remains dry in service? Well, let's take a look at our concrete slab on ground. Now, certainly if the water table comes up into contact with our slab on ground, or perhaps even above the slab on ground where we actually have hydrostatic pressure, we need to design some type of waterproofing into that concrete slab on ground, right? But most of the time, that's not the case. Most of the time, the water table is below our concrete slab on ground and the slab is just in contact with the soil or a base material. So why are we talking about sulfates in the soil that are water soluble coming into contact with the concrete slab? Well, that's because of the hydrologic cycle. It happens all over the planet in every climate, dry climates, wet climates, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter where you are. This cycle occurs and basically the groundwater uh, from the groundwater table evaporates and transmits vertically upward through the ground. It doesn't matter if it's 10 feet down, 100 feet down, or 1,000 feet below the surface of the earth, the liquid water from the groundwater table will transmit vertically in the form of vapor up towards the clouds in the sky where it condenses, falls back to earth, and reaches back down into the water table eventually. So you can see that the moisture goes through phase changes here from a liquid to a gas, to potentially even a solid. Now I'm going to focus on this area of the hydrologic chart here. So let's take a look at what our slab on ground is. That's the area from the water table, wherever it is located. Vapor moves upward through the, the soil, through the base layer, and through the concrete slab on ground. Now it does reach the concrete slab on ground and slow down because the concrete generally has a lower permeance than the soil below it. So it does build up under the slab on ground. Some of it condenses back into a liquid because that's, that's because it reaches dew point condensation. The dew point conditions below a slab on ground cause the vapor to condense back into a liquid. So some of the vapor continues through the concrete slab, some of it condenses to a liquid. So there you have the liquid that transmits the water soluble sulfates to contact the slab on ground. So how do we achieve this? Well, we can achieve it the same way that we achieve um, moisture protection for, for uh, moisture sensitive floor materials or moisture sensitive products stored on the slab using an effective vapor retarder. And I say effective vapor retarder because there's um, different qualities of vapor retarder on the market right now. So um, we call them vapor retarders because they slow the transmission of vapor. They don't necessarily prevent it. They're not necessarily barriers. However, there are organizations that are talking about what the permeance level is to be considered a barrier. And uh, the current uh, thought process is that a permeance of 0 0.01 perms or less would be considered a vapor barrier. And there are effective vapor barrier materials uh, for underneath slabs on ground on the market that meet that criteria. Now, what do these vapor retarders do? They do just as they say, they stop the vapor from moving. So they get to the underside of the vapor retarder, condense there, 
form that solution chemistry, that condensed liquid water, so your sulfate solution stays beneath the vapor retarder and does not come into contact with your slab on ground. And remember that sulfates are not transmitted through vapor. They're only transmitted in liquid water. They're water soluble. So just like the alkali salts in concrete, they're water soluble. They don't get moved or transmitted in vapor. Only when that vapor uh, moisture changes phases into a liquid uh, do they come into play. So here's a, a shot of the vapor retarder, an effective vapor retarder, very low permeance. And here it is doing its job. You can see that the condensed vapor underneath the vapor retarder, um, if there's sulfates in that soil, that's very high concentration of, of, of sulfates in that liquid water that's underneath the vapor retarder, but it's not into contact with your concrete. So you've achieved um, a category S class of zero, S zero as far as sulfate exposure by using an effective vapor retarder. So I want to leave with a parting um, thought uh, Mythbuster, um, for 40 years it has been thought that if you place concrete directly into contact with plastic, you cause curling or warping. I'm here to say that vapor retarders and barriers do not cause curling and warping. Actually, over the past 20 years, I have measured when I got the opportunity to, to look at the difference between concrete slabs on and off vapor retarder. And this is uh, often the case for uh, industrial um, uh, distribution facilities that have a an office area and um, a warehousing area. So the office area would be on a vapor retarder and the warehouse maybe is not on a vapor retarder. 100% of the time that I've been able to look at that, apples to apples over the past 20 years, the concrete on the vapor retarder curls less. So I have never seen a case where the concrete off the vapor retarder has curled um, less. And that's because the vapor retarder prevents the bottom of the slab from rehydrating, resaturating. When you don't have a vapor retarder, the vapor coming up from the water table below constantly feeds that bottom of that slab, constantly resaturates the bottom of the slab. So the bottom of the slab stays at about 100% relative humidity, where the top of the slab, in both cases, on and off a of vapor retarder, comes into equilibrium with the uh, ambient conditions above the slab. So when you have that vapor retarder and you allow the bottom of the slab to dry, the differential between the top and bottom of the slab is less. And if you're minimizing the moisture differential between the top and bottom of the slab, you're minimizing the curling. So now if you need to control curling, it's recommended that you use a vapor retarder. And we recommend using vapor retarders under industrial floors on ground, warehouse conditions, or office conditions. So I appreciate the time and uh, appreciate the award, the Concrete International Award. And again, my name is Scott Tarr and my contact information. And uh, thank you for your time.